God is saying that I want my sons and daughters to go. He is saying I want to send, but there has to be first a revelation of your wretchedness then there needs to be a confession of your sin and a repentance. And after that, the Lord is saying, I will do the work in you to refine you and to purify you. Then you will start seeing me, hearing me, knowing me. And then you will hear my call on your life. Who will go for me and who will I send? And I love that Isaiah stood in that place, raised his hand as high as he could. And he said, here am I, send me. In Psalms chapter 85, verses 4 through 11, the psalmist writes, Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? Everybody say the word revive. revive. That your people may rejoice in you. Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Lord, if there's anything we as a people need from you, anything that, that this country needs from you, that I need from you, Lord, it is mercy. Verse 8, I will hear what, the God, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Another way to say that, let them stop being foolish. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Verse 10. And I love this. If you haven't heard anything else I said tonight, listen to this verse. This is Psalms 85, verse 10. This is worth writing down and remembering. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second. So, mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. It's saying mercy and truth have kissed. Truth is not just an accurate perspective of facts, but it is that which comes from the heart and mind of God. It is that which is fully and eternally. And so, you know, uh, some people say, well, you know, I, there's this misunderstanding, but come on, you know my heart. I, I love how David writes. He says, Lord, you know the hearts of men, and yet you let us live because you're merciful. See, the thing is, is that when we are exposed to the unbridled truth of God. The only outcome is that we don't measure up. The Bible even says, let God be true, but everyone else a liar. And so, if all we have is truth, we have the holiness of God that we could never attain to. But see, God did not just give us truth. And it's interesting, this depiction of mercy and truth meeting together, that righteousness, meaning the fulfilling of God's requirement, the performing of the, of the fullness of God's expectation and purpose. So righteousness and peace have kissed. Again, if we are looking at righteousness, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Now, in the original language, the, the language there is actually way more visceral, and I'm not going to get into that. But he's just saying, on your best day, you don't even come close to measuring up to God's holy standard. And so what does a unholy person stand to gain in the presence of a holy God? Judgment, death, destruction, separation, judgment. But... God doesn't leave us there. He's not just saying, here's an expectation of perfection and righteousness that you could never get, and so I'm sorry for you. No, this word says that righteousness and peace have kissed. So how can we, when we deserve no peace, either in this life or in the next, can find peace? Peace. 
It is only in the cross where mercy and truth meet together. It is only in the cross where righteousness and peace kiss. Because if you look at our lives, our greatest attempts on our best days, we all fall short. The Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God, that we have all sinned, Romans 3.23. And then Romans 6.23 follows that up and says that the wages of sin is death. There is not a person alive that deserves it. So why can we be here? Why, why can we, uh, you know, some people say, oh man, I have to go to church. No, we get to come into the presence of a holy God. We don't deserve the atmosphere that we're experiencing right now. We don't deserve the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control that God works in us. We don't deserve him, but yet... In his righteousness and in his truth, he has declared peace and mercy because he says there is a judgment for sin. But I love you, my children. And so I didn't have kids just so I could kill them one day. The Lord declares peace and he didn't just say it with his mouth. He sent the word, Jesus Christ, to become sin so that we could experience the peace and mercy of God when we certainly don't deserve it. Now on Sunday, we have uh, been talking about the Holy Spirit, and this past Sunday we talked about the gift of speaking in tongues. Now there is one of the primary uh, passages that speak about the giving of the Holy Spirit, Peter actually quotes in his message in Acts 2. And the chapter that he quotes is found in Joel 2. Now, starting in verse 12. Well, the beginning of the chapter, let me just say it this way. That he's talking about the great and terrible day of the Lord. He's talking about judgment. God is coming and he is judging the earth. And it says that, you know, that there's a, a, a terrible army and that they do not break ranks, and, and they're perfectly aligned, that when God says to do something, they do it, and they leave just devastation in their wake. And in verse 12, it says, Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. He says, so rend your hearts, or tear your hearts, and not your garments. See, in this day, Clothes were extremely expensive. The common person would have one change of clothes, maybe two or three, uh, if they were rich. You know, and so when someone would experience a death in the family or go through some great tragedy, they would show that they are in mourning and that they're in this emotional upheaval by taking their clothes and tearing them. And what God is saying is, I don't want you to to tear what is physically valuable to you. I don't want you to destroy things. What I want you to do is humble yourself in the hardness of your heart, that, that, that thick casing of pride and selfishness. Tear that so that you can expose the sensitive uh, humility that, that God can speak to and relate to. He says, turn to me now with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Verse 13, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. I love this in, in verse 14. It says, who knows if he will relent and leave a blessing behind him. See, God should if he was fair, God should bring judgment. But as we turn to him, instead of judgment, he responds with mercy. And he even leaves a blessing. Now watch what kind of blessing it is. It says, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. I love that. That means so much, and I do not have time to even unpack that one sentence tonight. But here's what I do want to say about this is that God is a God who is worthy of our worship. God is a God who is due honor. Whether you respect him as king or not is irrelevant. 
He is king. You know, whether you've made him your Lord does not matter in the grand scheme of things. What ma- it matters to you, trust me. <laughs> but that does not, you, if you say, well, God's not my Lord, well, great, you have not shifted him on his throne at all. His heart goes out to you, but you did not impact his rule or his reign or his authority or his holiness. And see, what God is saying is that there is a righteous requirement to be in right relationship with me. I am your father, and so as my children, there are certain aspects in that relationship that you need to perform. You can't do it on your own, so I'm going to do it in you. I am your king, and so there are ways that you need to honor and respect and, and, and to give tribute and, to a king, but you can't do that on your own. So I will even provide for that. It says you need to honor the king, but I will put what is necessary in your hands to even be able to honor me. What God is saying is that I require pure worship that you are incapable of. So I will purify your hearts. I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my praises in your mouth. See, God is saying, yes, I am perfect and I do have a perfect standard. And yes, I know you can never meet that standard. I have met the standard. And now, In the face of righteousness and truth, I'm now offering mercy and peace. And even in the places of true worship, if you have your face to worship me the way that I desire, I will even provide what is necessary. But then it says this in verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord, weep between porch and altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Do you know what the priests are being instructed to pray for here? Repentance for themselves and the nation, but also saying, God, your name is upon us and our sin. We're making you look bad. And so, God, we are asking that you would restore our righteousness, our hope, and our worship. Help us to fear you, to love you, to obey you, to serve you, so that your name is glorified through my life. God, we can't do it. We've missed it in so many places. We're lazy and selfish and complacent and apathetic, and we're just sitting here doing our own stuff, pointing fingers at each other and comparing ourselves with one another. God, forgive us of these things and restore to us a holy right just eternal perspective. And the Lord says, when you start having that attitude, see, let let me just tell you something that I think this is going to be very powerful for some of you. Because I know when I heard it, this rocked my world. God does not respond to your circumstances. He responds to your faith. Some people are mad at God because he didn't do A, B, C, and D and says, God, can't you see that I'm feeling so bad? Now, don't get me wrong. As your father, his heart breaks when your heart breaks. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. As Lazarus lay dying and he was in a community full of mourning, he wasn't sad because Jesus or because Lazarus died. He knew he was going to raise him up, but he entered in to the heartbreak of other people. His compassion overwhelmed him and he began to weep. The Lord cares and he cares for you. You know, the Bible even says specifically that he is near the brokenhearted. So if you have a broken heart here tonight, please know that your father in heaven is nearer to you now than he has ever been. And the pain doesn't let you feel that. You don't feel the nearness of God. All you feel is pain. And, but your father is there holding you, saying, it's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. You're going to get through this, this valley. My grace is sufficient for you. Weeping may last for a night, 
But joy comes in the morning. Jesus said as he opened the book of Isaiah and began to read, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn in Zion. Look, if, if I don't say anything else tonight, let me just, God is compassionate. He cares, and he cares about you. He cares what you're going through. He is a good, loving father. He actually cares more about your heart than you do. But God is not a God who is moved into action on your behalf based on how bad you feel or how loudly you scream, or how much you throw yourself on the floor. I mean, anybody been to Fry's has seen that whole thing when the, you know, I don't care how much you scream, Johnny. You are not, I'm sorry, Johnny, it's not, it's not you. <laughs> I don't care how much you scream, you're not getting your way. That is not making me want to acquiesce to your need. You know what the Bible does say? You have not because you ask not. And when I ask my father, I'm going to him as my father with respect, with knowing that he is capable, able, and wants to be in my life. And if he says no, then I take that with maturity that when I realize then God says no, it's because he has a plan, a perspective, and a call for me that is bigger than what I'm wanting him to say yes to. And in fact, many times our yes is, says no to God. And so God says no to that thing so he, you, he can say yes to you in the destiny that he planned for you. The Bible says that he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Each one of you in this room has a purpose, has a call. There are things that God has placed on the inside of you that he has placed in no one else. There are people that you will interact with that in, in your sphere of influence you will affect that no one else can do it. God has called you. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not here just to quote a book. I'm not here just to play church and look pretty for, for folks for a couple of hours and then go home and talk about how Sister Susie was, you know. <laughs> if your name's Susie out there, that is not personal. I want to see God. And even the verse for this year, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. This has been my prayer and it seems the more I'm asking God to purify me, it seems the further away I get. It's like one step forward, two steps back. But you know, what I do know is that even though I may be feeling frustrated at certain times, if I keep trusting him. See, the Bible says in Proverbs, uh, I want to say it's 24 verse 6, uh, that, that the righteous fall seven times but rise again. And it may seem like we're in a season where we're just stumbling, 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 stumbling. And each time Jesus is saying, get up, son. Get up, daughter. Let's keep going. And the more we have that perspective of saying, it, Lord, no matter what, no matter what it costs, no matter how many times I fall, I don't care how frustrated I get, I want I want you. And I want you alone. He says, All right, on this one will I look. See, God says in Isaiah 66, verse 1, he says that heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What, what can you possibly do for me? Anything that you would try to build me, guess what? I made that. It's like my daughter one time said, I want to buy you a present. I said, okay. She said, can I have 20 bucks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I love how he continues with that, and he says, but on this one will I look says, you, you, you want to know how to get God's attention? One who has clean hands and a pure heart and who trembles at my word. The one that, that listens to the word of God and, and believes it as if he actually means what he says. He says, on, for that person whose heart is loyal to me, I will move heaven and earth. In another place, the Lord says that he is looking 
to and fro throughout the whole earth to find someone that he can show himself strong on, on their behalf. He is looking for people to break out in the miraculous in their lives. He's looking for sons and daughters to show the goodness, glory, and power of God. But the requirement is a heart that is loyal to him. Joel 2, verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine, thank you, Holy Spirit, and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I want to read that again. Verse 19, The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you the grain. That is not just the word, it is speaking about revelation. I will send you new wine. That is talking about the refreshing of the Holy Spirit and oil. It's the anointing. And you will be satisfied by them. And the Lord is saying that there are so many of his children that are not feasting at the banquet of his table because they're filling their self up with the junk food of the world. And he says, I desire to give you grain, new wine and oil, but you're eating popcorn and Instagram. Lord, change our appetites. Help us to be those that are satisfied and satiated on your word, on your spirit, on your presence, God. The parable of the ten virgins, you have five wise, five foolish. They were alike in every single way except one. The five wise had oil in their lamps. The five foolish did not. The lamps signify our calling and our gifting. God will not inspect your gift in judgment. He's the one who gave, you, gave them to you. What he said is, what did you do with the gift? What did you put in the gift? Did you spend time with me in prayer and in the secret place so I, the anointed one, could, could allow uh, my Holy Spirit, which brings unity and glory, that it would, you know, how blessed it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like oil on the head of Aaron, that it flows down the head and down the beard and down the garments. God is saying, did you spend time with me? me and fill your lamp as you were sitting at my feet with the oil of my presence. To finish verse 19, it says, I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former reign faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Everybody say former rain. Everybody say latter rain. So if rain is talking about the washing of God's word, the fullness of God's word, the fulfillment of God's word, we could even say that Acts chapter 2 was the initial outpouring of God's reign. And we see that there was the early reign that Peter preached a message, 3,000 people were saved. He preached another message, another 5,000 people were saved. There was an outpouring. But do you know that God did not stop in the book of Acts? He didn't stop with the early church and he hasn't stopped yet. That God, just as he was faithful to send the former rain in Acts 2, that the Lord is saying, before I come, the great and terrible day of the Lord, let me translate, before the second coming of Christ, that God will once again give not just the former rain, but the latter rain. And yes, it is on whosoever will. But it is not on everyone because most don't will. Most don't fear the Lord. Most people's hearts are not faithful to God. And so there's this word that we hear all the time in, in, the, in, uh, in the Bible that is linked to this experience that we call revival. And it's the word remnant. There were 500 that Jesus showed himself after he resurrected. 
And he, what he said to them all was, go into the upper room and wait until you're endued with power. On the day of Acts 2, there was not 500 people there. There was only 120. This is a word for somebody. You can get to heaven not waiting on the Lord. Although I wouldn't play that game because you're, you're, you're dancing on a cliff. But it's those who wait upon the Lord that receive new strength. And that is not strength just, okay, just get a little, you know, it's like crack open a five-hour energy and now you can do some more stuff. No, he's saying, I will give you the supernatural ability of my Holy Spirit to put my word on the inside of you when you don't know what to say, to give you strength and ideas when you've all run out of your own wisdom. He says, I will be with you, around you. See, an example of this is Peter. All he did is just walk down the street. And he was so saturated with the presence of the Holy Spirit that people were healed. He didn't touch anybody. There was no praying. It was all presence. And I struggle Sometimes, because I hear many preachers talk about um, that there's going to be this last day revival where there's going to be a, a lot of people coming, you know, uh, to, to the church and it's this last day harvest. And yes, God is moving and I'm not trying to diminish that. But Jesus said before the Antichrist comes that there's going to be a great falling away. And I see that in our generation. Churches are closing 58% faster than their opening. Every year in America, I think this statistic was from 2022, if I believe, or if I'm remembering correctly, that 4,000 churches in America were being planted. 7,000 were closing. And those trends have only gone up since then. The church in America is dying. We're weak and anemic. Why? Why? Because we've lost the fear of the Lord. Because God has blessed us with prosperity and we've fed ourselves. And our appetites have been of this world and we, we found a synchronistic, compromised Christianity where we can be comfortable. And if anybody challenges our comfort, we'll say, well, that you're just not being Christian. And we see that we are facing another dark age, not because people are taking the Bible out of our hands, but because we are losing our reverence for the word of God. We have the Bible in every language, translation. If you can't read, it will say it to you. If you can't hear, there's Braille. Like, there's every type of media for, the, for you to access the Bible. And because it's so abundantly available, we don't count it as precious. It'll be there tomorrow, so I don't need to value it today. See, the Lord needs us to get to the place where your word is more important to me than my necessary food. That your word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto your feet. That your word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. That at your word the heavens were made and at your word I can rise with you. See, you don't have hope because you belong to a Christian club. You have hope because you have faith in Jesus, and the faith in Jesus is based upon what he reveals about himself in his word. And so God does promise an outpouring. He does promise revival. He does promise that the, the power and the glory that we see revealed in the book of Acts. He's saying, I'm just getting started. He's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. Well, Pastor Trevor, how, how would, why would you say that? Well, because in Acts 2, they said, well, okay, you know, the Holy Spirit came and uh, they're speaking in other tongues. These guys must be drunk. And Peter said, they're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. This is what the prophet Joel was talking about. And I remember that as we're looking at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it equates to this picture of wine and new wine. He promises it here in Joel 2, but also Jesus' first miracle. 
They had wine when the banquet started. They had wine in the book of Acts. They had wine at the day of Pentecost. But then the wine ran out. And so Jesus touched the pillar or the, these pots of water and turned the water into wine. And the, the master of ceremonies took it and stopped the entire party and he made an announcement. He says, normally you give the good wine first, wait till everybody's drunk, everybody's partying, now they can't taste anything anyway, then you put out the cheap wine. He says, but you've saved the best for last. And so... The reason why he did that as a first miracle, there's many reasons, but one of them is it was a prophetic picture of what he plans to do with the outpouring of his spirit in his church. He's saying that, yes, I will give wine at the beginning of the wedding banquet, but I'm saving the best wine for last. But this wine will not be, look, I am praying and fasting and crying out and declaring for there to be another awakening in America. So I'm not trying to say that that's not going to happen. I pray for that, and I'm asking that we, we all together would begin to fast and pray for this nation. But it's not just going to come to everybody. It's the remnant, the whosoever will, those who put, set their face to fear the Lord and to obey him, who, who ask God for the wine and the grain the, 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 to purify our hearts so that we can worship him in the way that he desires. The noon wine will not be poured out on comfortable Christians. This, we're not talking about salvation. We're not talking about getting to heaven. We're talking about bringing heaven to earth. Twenty-four. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Talking about the Holy Spirit and anointing. Verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. eaten, The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. And my great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of my people. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And now we find and we come to the famous verse in Joel 2 verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord, and I will show wonders in heaven and on earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion... And in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said. Notice this last part. Among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now, there's a theme that we find. You know, I mean, I don't know about you. I want the outpouring. I want the refreshing. I want to see revival. But what we need to understand is with revival, something is being re Vived. Vive, vive, meaning life. And so if something has to be re-lifed, that means it has been de-lifed. We have another word for that. It's called dead. What brings death? The wages of sin. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely God desires there to be revival, and we need, it starts with repentance, because the thing is, is why we are many times dead men walking in our churches here in America is because we've gotten comfortable and complacent. We're no longer sensitive to the prodding or the correction of the Holy Spirit. 
We've allowed our hearts to get hard, our necks to get stiff, and we say, you know, Jesus, I'll say I love you on Sunday, but don't ask me to give up my time, talents, or resources. I'm going to do me, and I'll just give you a little nod on Sunday. We've become weak and anemic. Paul had a young son in the faith named Timothy. In Timothy 1, he's encouraging him um, and, and talking about the gifts that he has and, and, and telling him to, to how to be a pastor and the Holy Spirit is moving. It's a powerful, powerful book. And then in 2 Timothy, something has happened in between there where Paul has to start talking to him and says, the gift that you had, you were this blazing fire of the Holy Spirit and now it has gone dormant that there has been a spirit of intimidation or a Jezebel spirit uh, uh, and, and that has been launched against the movement of the spirit at the church and you've allowed that to come down and so now you're not preaching holiness as much as you used to. That we're just going to have nice services. That in the seemed guise of order and respectfulness, you're actually diminishing the power of the Holy Spirit. And what Paul says is, you need to stir up the gift. And let me tell you, kingdom culture, men and women of God in this generation, if Timothy needed to stir up the gift that was within him, how much more do you and I on a daily basis stir up the gift of God that is within us? The number one way to do that, pray in the spirit, but also the other spiritual disciplines of getting into God's word and prayer and worship and talking to the Lord and allowing him to talk to you. And if there, you, whatever you're going through, see, the world will try to get you to shut up and sit down. It will try to kill, steal, destroy, and intimidate I don't know how many times people are starting to get an effective prayer life and start getting into the word and then all hell breaks loose until they finally let go of their disciplines then everything calms down. And they say, well, I'm not going to do that again because I don't want to go through that. The enemy just won. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, when the enemy comes to try to intimidate you, we do the same thing that Jesus did. The Lord rebuke you. Get out my face. I will worship the Lord. I will not satisfy my own appetites. I will humble myself before God. He's the one that I'm going to worship and serve, not myself and not you. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, Paul is right, or sorry, Peter is writing to a church that is undergoing severe persecution. And I'm not talking about their friends were saying bad things about him. They were being uh, robbed, persecuted, thrown in prison, having all of their uh, money taken away, killed, tortured publicly. They were going through some intense stuff. And so Peter is encouraging his peop the, 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 the church there, and he's telling them that you're going to go through trials. But if you fear the Lord, you keep your eyes on him, you keep yourself in the love of God, you're going to be victorious. Even if you go through things that are not good, it is creating an eternal glory for you. And he's encouraging them to keep the faith. And he also continues and says, God's grace is going to be with you. He's going to give you his Holy Spirit. He's going to give you a supernatural power to do what he's called you to do. Yes, it's getting dark and it's getting darker. But the light is coming and he's getting brighter. So be encouraged. He says, but if you want to share in this glory and in this power and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's a price to pay. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, he says, For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. Here's my point in saying that. How many of you want revival? How many of you want more of God in your life, in your, in your sphere of influence? Uh, it, you know, this is my desire. 
I am asking God to fill us up personally to overflowing so that as we're in this place in worship and prayer and listening to the word, that this place gets filled up to overflowing, that we start spilling out into the streets and in our community. And this has been a constant prayer from even before we started the church in our house. Lord, what are you calling us to do for Tucson? I'm all for good preaching in children's ministry, but what does that mean if we're not going out there? And I'm not saying I have all the answers of the timeline, but that is the cry of our heart is, Lord, help us to be light to a dark world. And what does that look like in our context? Is it a feeding program? Is it, is it street evangelism? Is, you know, I, I don't know what it looks like, but we're asking, and I know that God's faithful to answer that in due season. But he's saying before we get there, though, I don't want a bunch of zombies out in the streets. I need to revive you once again. Now, God formed Adam of the dust of the ground. There's blood and bone, muscle and flesh. And was he alive? Not until God breathed. It says then, the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then he became a living being. Ezekiel 37, it's the famous account of when God took Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. And there were human bones from a a destroyed army that were drying out in the sun. And God said, can these bones live? (laughs) He answered very well. He said, Lord, you know. He says, I have my opinions, but I'm going to go ahead and keep that to myself. Here's a little uh, insight. If God's asking you a question, he's not looking for information. So he says, Lord, only you know. And he says, prophesy that the bones would come together. And so he does. He begins declaring the word of the Lord. And as he does, the prophetic word is now bringing order where bone is coming upon bone. And then now there's uh, sinew and, and muscle and flesh, but they're not alive yet. So now you just have all of these reformed and uh, refreshed bodies but that still have no purpose or unction or practical value. And in fact, it's kind of worse because now they're a bunch of dead bodies. And he's like, okay, what do we do? Like, I imagine being in that point between those verses where he's like, all right, the army's together. (laughs) You know? The Lord says, okay, well, what are we going to do now? Lord, only you know. He says, all right, prophesy to the breath. See, we as the people of God, we need to declare God's word, his order into our lives. But it's not enough that we are just declaring. We also need to ask the Holy Spirit to infuse. But it's not just them out there. You need to understand. It is me. It is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God, fill me afresh. And God says, I want to do it. I want to bring revival. And just as in Joel 2, he said, I will pour out my spirit. But if you remember, there was sin that brought judgment. And after the judgment, God said, repent. Gather the elders Let the ministers who who minister before the Lord weep between porch and altar. They say, get outside the church and get on your face. Leave your place of prominence and position and get open and bare publicly before the Lord. Because it happens in that order. We're a people who are blessed and we allow that blessing to cause us to become comfortable and soft and fat. And even Jesus says in Revelation, he says, you think that you are rich and of need of nothing, but you don't really understand that you are poor and wretched and naked. He says, buy from me gold refined in the fire. He's talking about the purifying process. Buy from me gold in, uh, refined in fire. I will put anointing oil on your eyes so you can see. I will give you a robe of righteousness to clothe your nakedness. I will do the work, but it requires first you realizing that you're poor, wretched, naked, and miserable. And my prayer is, Lord, let a spirit of revelation and repentance fall on myself, on us here as a church. 
See, God does not expose our true condition to us to alienate us or to hurt us, but so that he can heal us. It's the same thing with Isaiah 6. He thought he had it all together, but in the presence of God, he said, woe is me, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And this was the high priest and the prophet to the nation. So God had to take a coal and purify him put the coal to his lips, and then, and only then, could he hear the Lord say, now that your sin is taken away from you and you've been purged and purified, who will go for me and who will I send? And it's the same thing with this house. God is saying that I want my sons and daughters to go. He is saying I want to send, but there has to be first a revelation of your wretchedness Then there needs to be a confession of your sin and a repentance. And after that, the Lord is saying, I will do the work in you to refine you and to purify you. Then you will start seeing me, hearing me, knowing me. And then you will hear my call on your life. Who will go for me and who will I send? And I love that Isaiah stood in that place, raised his hand as high as he could. And he said, here am I, send me. Lord, I pray that that would be be the heart cry of this house. Lord, help us to endure the realization of our wretchedness. God, I pray that we would be a people who fall on our face in fasting and weeping and mourning and in repentance of our sins. God, we ask that you would refine us and purify us as a people. And Lord, we are asking that we would hear your call. God, it's not just about, well, what am I supposed to do? What's my position and my place of prominence and how do I get significance? But Lord, how are you wanting to use me to bless someone else? How do I bear fruit to, for you and to give you glory and for your kingdom? How can I serve others around me? How can I learn to die to myself, to deny myself, to take up my cross and to follow you? Because make no mistake, church, Jesus, he's in your workplace. He's at your school. He's in the grocery store. He's going places looking for those that will call upon his name. And he's looking for his sons and daughters to follow him. But we have our beats on. We got our shades on. We're we're, we're scrolling through our feed. And the Lord is crying out, who will go for me and who will I send? I'm looking for those who are willing to endure the process. Yes, there is a price. Jesus said, buy from me. Gold refined in the fire. He says, I'll give you the gold, but you have to buy it. So how do we buy it? Humility, repentance, enduring the refining process. See, <laughs> wouldn't that be a thing? The angel comes with the coal to Isaiah's lips and he just takes off running. But how many times do we do that? And God is saying, trust me, stand there, son and daughter. Yes, this will hurt, but weeping lasts for a night. But joy will come in the morning. I do not do this to harm you. This is a surgical medical procedure because the sin in your life is a cancer that is blinding you. It's causing you to become desensitized. You know, the Bible talks about leprosy as a type of sin. Now, leprosy, it doesn't attack your body. It's not like you have leprosy and now your body parts start falling off. What happens is leprosy attacks your nervous system. So you're no longer sensitive to pain, which we would think, oh, that's awesome. No, it's not. Because you cut your finger, you're not taking care of it. You don't know you cut your finger. You're bleeding all over the place. Now it's gotten infected and then it goes gangrene and falls off. Foot, eye, nose. And eventually you die from it, not feeling a thing. Lord, take out our heart of stone. Give us a heart of flesh that we may be a people who walk in repentance. Lord, we need revival. And it doesn't matter how good I preach or how loud I yell, but God, I, I, I pray that you would come and move because unless you move, unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. And unless the Lord builds the city, the builders build in vain. And so Lord, we are asking that you would watch this house, that you would watch this city, that you would build for your namesake. We are not here to build a kingdom unto ourselves, but unto you, O God.
And it's funny because even in my passion, And as I'm feeling the heart of the Lord encouraging sons and daughters saying, come on, you can do it. That the enemy is already there trying to give me a list of reasons why I'm not qualified and why I'll never measure up and why it won't happen for me. And I just bind the voice of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. I come against every spirit of fear and intimidation now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray, Jesus, as the author and finisher of our faith, that you would loose faith in this house. See, the reality is is that we're all like Gideon. He was a man who was the least of all the families and the least in his family, And when God showed up to him, he was hiding in a wine vat, hiding from his enemies so he could eat his lunch. He was scared, intimidated, and he was nothing in his own eyes. And God comes to him in that place. He didn't wait till he was a little more presentable. God came to him in his place of intimidation and inferiority. And he said in that place, man of valor, rise in this strength of yours. And Gideon He wasn't strong. He wasn't great. He wasn't prominent. He wasn't courageous. What he was is he was a man who believed God. Is there anybody in here who is willing to take the risk to trust God? On this one will I look, the one who has clean hands, a pure heart, and who trembles at my word. Because if God is saying, rise, sons and daughters, in this strength of yours, then we can in Jesus' name.